Okay, all. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a two-header. Uh, uh, both myself, I'm Dan uh, from Founders and Coders, and Rafe are going to take two halves of this talk. I'm going to start with just an overview of who Founders and Coders are. And uh, Rafe, who uh, is part of, I lose count very easily, but part of Fact 5, uh, which is in session at the moment, uh, started with us in May. Uh, he's going to give you a bit of an overview of his experience of the program. So we're, we're actually a freelance cooperative. Uh, we're based in uh, Bethnal Green. Oh, yep, got it. Uh, and I suppose what's interesting about us is we run a free, uh, full-time, 16-week uh, coding boot camp. Uh, it's 100% JavaScript, pretty much, and we spend an awful lot of time with Node, uh, which I guess is the connection between uh, us and this space. So the, the company is actually, it's a, it's a social enterprise. We're entirely owned and run by the graduates of the program. Uh, there are three mentors, uh, uh, one of whom, uh, Nelson Creer, will be familiar to some of you, uh, who's a long-standing member of the Node community in London. Uh, this whole thing started in January of last year. Uh, it was an uh, experimental project in Camden Town. Uh, we managed to, uh, I managed to wangle a bit of space uh, in a project funded by the Mayor's office. And uh, we took uh, 14 people off, more or less off the street uh, in January of, of that year, and uh, gave them an introduction to uh, the web and web development. Uh, so fast forward about 18 months, and uh, this uh, picture here is of the, the Fat Cooperative. Uh, we're now based in Bethnal Green. We moved out of Camden Town when the funding ran out uh, last year. We actually did a crowdfunding campaign uh, which paid the rent for the first three or four months. And uh, we've now run two coding boot camps in our new space. So uh, the key points about uh, what we're doing, what, what uh, I think marks it out, what makes it different, what we've learned, are firstly uh, JavaScript. So this, this was a very interesting question when we got going. Uh, uh, what are you going to do if you're taking people who don't have any experience of software development and trying to teach them as quickly as you can something that will be of use to them uh, either for their own projects or to help them go and get work? We actually started uh, with a mixture of Python and JavaScript. Uh, Python, uh, largely because it's a Python is a wonderful language to begin with. It's a it's a it's a really good beginner's language. There are also an awful lot of learning resources out there for Python, and you can do a lot of really powerful things with it. So it seemed like quite a good choice. Also, uh, given that uh, we didn't have a lot of time, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, uh, there was a lot I could put together very quickly and, and produce something that was coherent. Uh, at that time, although Node was an exciting technology, uh, it didn't have a lot of easy entry points. So I, I did consider it, but decided against it, and actually had a very successful time for the first half of last year, teaching a lot of Python and a bit of JavaScript. But as it turns out, it was useless, uh, more or less, for the people that, are, that I was trying to teach, uh, because there's to a first approximation, almost no such thing as a junior de developer role for a Python programmer. Nobody wants juniors, and nobody wants Python juniors. In fact, almost the only plausible way, uh, as I discovered, to get anyone's interest uh, in terms of getting my graduates into the job market uh, was to offer JavaScript skills. There are still opportunities for JavaScript devs. So uh, that, along with the fact that we, we got slightly bored of the online materials we were using, uh, the structured materials that 
that we could just get off the shelf. And again, it was unusual because we were, uh, we were effectively just me. And um, we, as, I, as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's a free, it's a free coding boot camp and it always has been. And uh, for, for that reason, when we started, we started with uh, materials from places like Udacity and Coursera, where we could just pull stuff together. Actually, it turned out that wasn't quite so interesting. So in the middle of last year, uh, we switched it all around. We just immersed ourselves in Node, which I actually didn't know that well. Uh, and as I said, the, the resources online were a little bit hard for beginners, but we did it anyway. We changed what we were doing around from being this quite structured thing, using online resources, to being a very unstructured, uh, very team-based thing. And it's worked very well. So uh, the next lesson, the next lesson is uh, that uh, the fact that we started as a project, a project where the aim was to offer people something, anything, but to do it for free, uh, gave us a whole bunch of constraints that, that gave us a different perspective on what we were doing. Uh, and actually, that ended up being quite creative because we had to work out how we could do things, again, without the time, without the resources. We didn't have much time to put a syllabus together. I didn't have a lot of uh, support. So it was really just me and a room full of beginners expecting uh, knowledge. And uh, because of all of those constraints, uh, we've been able to produce something that uh, we think has, has a lot of value, uh, has attracted a lot of very talented people uh, who are interested, in fact, really excited about learning, learning how to write software. And we can do it with almost no resources. And I think, again, that's a little bit unusual. There's not many people trying to do that in quite the way that we're doing it. Uh, and it's because we started from this point uh, of having almost no resources and having to do this as cheaply as we could uh, that we've been able to do things the way we've done them. So the third thing that's made what we're doing possible uh, is that from a very early stage, I, I was steered away from trying to commercialize what we were doing uh, by, in fact, it was by my third cohort of students. At that point, I was aware that I needed funding, I needed some way to make a living out of what I was doing. And I, I remember, in fact, it was about this time last year, it was in June or July last year, I asked my then uh, the then cohort of students, what, what I could charge for the kind of course we were doing. And they all were very clear that uh, I shouldn't charge, that actually what we were doing, it only worked because it was free. And uh, my response to that was, how on earth are we going to make a, how am I going to make a living out of this? And they said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll work for you after we're finished. And uh, so that, it was not my idea, but it was a student's idea that the model we're now adopting, which is to provide people a free education and then to give them, give them uh, a part of the business that is creating more developers. Uh, so we, we've now set ourselves up as a social enterprise, uh, constitute as a freelance cooperative. And as I said, in one of, uh, as I said earlier, so up on one of the earlier slides, uh, almost all of the members uh, except for uh, three, three mentors, have been through the program. So it's a kind of, it's a bootstrapped uh, company. Uh, it's a bootstrapped course. And uh, we are very close to the point where we're beginning to break even. We, we have a combination of funding through uh, getting people hired, and we're getting some recruitment fees for that. That's just started to happen very recently. And we're also doing projects. That's something we've been doing almost from the beginning. But we have a few clients. We're getting some projects. We have a, a small agency. 
that's staffed, again, entirely by our, the graduates of our program. And so what we've got is this sustainable model, we hope, capable of generating its own income, uh, giving people a training in how to be a software developer from a standing start, and then giving them control of the company that does all of that. Uh, and we think, give us another few months, but we think we'll have a model that would make it r relatively straightforward for, for uh, both our graduates and possibly other people to set up similar schools elsewhere. So the, the goal of all of this uh, is to create a sort of open source framework for people to set up their own, uh, their own free coding schools. So I suppose the, you know, the, the guiding ethos of all of this is giving people free training, free access into the world that most of us here already occupy. Uh, and to do that in, in a way that doesn't require input from outside, that's, as I said, self-sustaining. So that's, that's, the, that's the overarching theme of Founders and Coders. And I'm going to hand over now to Rafe, who I don't think has any slides. He's going to give us some reflections on the, uh, the current cohort. That's it. Thank you. Um, so Dan's given sort of three reasons why Founders and Coders is sort of um, a successful organization. And I tried to think of something that would um, complement uh, that talk. And the obvious thing to do was uh, three reasons why Founders and Coders is not so great. Uh, unfortunately, I'm far too spineless for that. So instead, what I am doing is three things that make Founders and Coders um, a successful learning experience. Um, and I think we all sort of have people asking us, uh, you know, how can I learn to code? How can I um, get into um, what you do? And hopefully this will be useful um, when you're guiding your friends and your family uh, in starting in coding. So the first thing, sadly, is not unique to FAC. It's in most code schools, in most coding boot camps. But I think it's in most of them because it works. And that's project work. So mostly we do one project a week. Um, and it really sort of inspires the ethos of programming as building something. Um, and I think that's when we were doing the prerequisites for the course, that's what a lot of us fell in love with in terms of coding. Uh, we really enjoyed having something at the end of the day that we had built. Um, it's also something concrete to apply our learning to. So uh, when you're being taught a new design pattern or a new algorithm, it really helps to sort of burn that in and to build up the muscle memory for doing that. But probably the most important thing is working in teams. So we worked in four teams throughout the eight weeks. Um, and there was a lot of learning experiences. So one of my teammates said it was the first time he'd ever written code with clothes on. So that was one learning experience for him. <laughs> Another is letting go of wanting to do everything in the code base your way. And you, know, you have the right way of doing things. But in a big project where everyone is working, we had to learn to um, do it differently. Uh, keeping abreast of code that you didn't write yourself. That was actually one of the more difficult learning points. Um, when you write your own code, you think you understand it. Um, but when you read other people's code, uh, that's when you really start to understand you know, the ways of thinking in JavaScript. And uh, probably the most difficult thing as well was we had to decide whether we were two spaces or four spaces for indentation, uh, which was pretty difficult. Um, the other thing that really works well is the peer teaching. So as Dan said, a lot of the practices of founders and coders came from the fact we don't really have any money. Um, and also, it's free. So you need to get people to do the teaching in the classroom as they're learning if you don't have much money or time. But also, when it's free, you can ask that of people. If people are paying a lot of money, they are expecting the teaching time, even when it's not the best way to learn. Uh, the reason that peer, peer learning works really well is because knowledge is not a one-dimensional parameter, right? Like, just because you know something that I don't doesn't mean that you know everything I know. 
Well, maybe in your cases it does, but in general, in the classroom, it doesn't. Um, also, we're all roughly at the same level. So we think about JavaScript in the same way and programming in the same way. We use the same vocabulary to express programming and coding. Um, and that actually is a really powerful way of um, being able to teach others. You might think about things in a very sophisticated way, but unless you're going to spend the time to get me up to your level, that doesn't help me when you're trying to explain things to me. And the final thing is it encourages self-sufficiency, and it's less intimidating. So uh, you know, someone who's been coding for one year, for two years, for three years, is teaching you something. Maybe you just can't get it. Maybe you're just not ready to get it. Uh, if the girl next to you has already got it, um, you're pretty sure you can get it too. If she did it, so can you. So uh, that's the thing about peer teaching. And the final sort of ethos um, of founders and coders, which was really useful, was a sort of a wariness of using code that we don't understand. So in week one, before we'd started any node, our project was to build a static blog site. And jQuery was forbidden. And it was so painful, and it was so frustrating trying to do anything without jQuery. But I learned so much about traversing the DOM, about events, about what things look like, even things about pure JavaScript, about events, about what happens when you get undefined is not a function. These things were really, really useful. Um, and we also like to know whether you can build your own basic version of a library or a module that you're using. It's not because we think that we're going to do it better or that we think that you know, edge cases and error handling aren't useful, but it's really powerful to understand the basic core functionality of what you're using. And then when you compare it to what they've done, you start to realize all the edge cases that you do need to deal with, um, which is um, really useful. And in fact, it paid dividends even on the course. Uh, so one week, we were using a plugin for Happy um, for user authentication. And we were all sort of sat around because all our code was broken, and we didn't know why. And it was getting to the point where we were sort of adding semicolons and like removing trailing commas on objects, because we thought, maybe this is the problem. And then we decided to go into the code for that plugin and just console log our way through it. And we realized it wasn't our code that was broken. It was actually theirs. It was a tiny error. It was that they'd done an underscore instead of a capital letter in their variable name. But then we fixed that. And then we had our own version of that. And it worked. And we knew that everyone else had a version that maybe didn't work if they got the latest version. And so that was really cool. And so I think if you are giving advice to your friends, I think try and guide them in a way that really gives them ownership of the code that they're using and that they're writing. That's it. Thank you very much.